Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number two. Let's jump right into this episode segment of Homestead Happenings. What has been going on on 3B Farm and Homestead this week? Well, this week we have spent quite a bit of time on preparations for winter. Winter is on its way and our, well, we're surrounded by woods. A lot of trees, a lot of leaves. And unfortunately, the trees that we have have a tendency to be a little bit later in the season as far as dropping the leaves. So uh, many times I end up having to do multiple passes with regards to um, cleaning up leaves. And quite frankly, that is something that I absolutely used to hate doing. I saw it as such a waste of time. Uh, I, I see things differently now. Now, it's not to say that I enjoy raking or gathering leaves. Trust me, I do not. But it's amazing when your perspective changes with regards to the end product, how your perspective changes with regards to the effort and energy that goes into it. And you see, before I used to take those leaves and just kind of gather them up and blow them or move them down into the woods where they would rot down and Next year, I would do the same thing. But now I see those leaves as, well, kind of a resource. And so I gather those leaves up and they go in with my pigs, they go in with my chickens, and it's kind of carbon that they can break down. It, I guess, for lack of a better term, entertains them. But in the midst of them scratching around in it, in the case of the chickens, or walking around on it, in the case of the pigs, that is mixing with their manure breaking down and creating a beautiful compost that I will be able to harvest in the spring. And so for me now, again, I'm not going to lie and say I enjoy cleaning up leaves, but my perspective has changed. And so it's not quite as tough of a chore as it used to be. This week, we also had a visit from our local state veterinarian. Um, We are taking part in a study a blind study with Cornell University with regards to brucellosis in um, pastured pig uh, herds. And so the vet veterinary, the state veterinary, um, stopped by our uh, homestead this week and uh, did a walkthrough in preparation for them coming out the first week of December uh, when they're going to draw blood from all of the various pigs. Now, I I know for some people having the uh, government come in and be involved in something like this uh, might be a little bit disconcerting, but for me, it was one of those situations. It's not costing me a dime to have them do the study, and I would much rather know than not know uh, whether or not my herd was infected with brucellosis. And quite frankly, I don't have any reason to suspect that they are. Um, There's really not any reason to suspect that there's any kind of a wide spread outbreak of the disease in New York State, but a couple of years ago there were a couple of farms not too far away that were infected with the disease and it ended up transferring to some humans and that's actually how they found out about it. And so now they're trying to do a wider study on it uh, just to make sure that they have it contained. And so definitely glad to be a part of that even though Generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of government intervention. The last thing that's been happening here on our homestead is uh, a bit of cleanup from the standpoint of 20 plus years of accumulation of junk. And I don't know about at your homestead, and, and quite frankly, I can't even blame this on homesteading. This is an accumulation of stuff that has happened since my wife and I have been married. And some of this has kind of been those junk boxes that you have at the end of every move. Uh, that you're you're going to get to and sort out someday, and that day never comes. And so there was definitely some of that. Uh, but also, some of it has been an accumulation of stuff 
from the standpoint of homesteading where maybe people have given me things that they thought I could use or I've purchased things uh, for projects that I've just never gotten around to. And so I brought in a dumpster this week and uh, we have spent, uh, we spent all day Saturday um, going through uh, uh, the basement and uh, cleaning out the garage and getting rid of some of the accumulated bits and bobs uh, this and that bric-a-brac laying around the homestead uh, of either broken things or projects that I'm just never going to get to and it's not really anything that I could pass on to anybody else uh, and so I have a dumpster full right now in my driveway and I gotta tell you it really feels good to uh, have gotten some of that stuff out of the way and now I can organize things a little bit better for things that are more pressing with regards to the homestead. So that's what's been happening here this week on 3B Farm and Homestead. Uh, and not a whole lot exciting, but it's necessary stuff. And uh, again, going back to the leaves, some of that, uh, it's tasks that I, I think all of us, uh, anybody that's a homeowner, deals with uh, the the clean up of leaves in the fall and the disposal, at least anybody that lives in, in a climate where the leaves fall off the trees. And uh, so when you look at it from the standpoint of it being a resource instead of a nuisance, um, I think your perspective on the effort that you put into it changes a little bit. At least it has for me. On this episode's community quarter segment, I wanted to chat a little bit with regards to not an event that's happened, but an event that's going to happen. Actually, it's an event that's coming up in January of 2020. And I ran across it in my Facebook feed. I'm not really quite sure. In fact, I don't really remember even how I ran across it. But it is a conference called the Rogue Food Conference that's going to be taking place in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it really got me to thinking about the different homesteading or homesteading related conferences that are starting to spring up all around the United States. Um, I know that uh, Mother Earth News Fairs have happened for a number of years and I really would like to go to one of those. I've kind of kicked myself. There was one that was held up in Burlington, Vermont, I think three or four years ago. My mom and dad were actually going to go and then for for some reason or another, they weren't able to. Um, it was slightly before, I, as I recall, it was before I had kind of discovered this whole world of homesteading, but I've kind of kicked myself that I didn't go to it because it hasn't come back yet uh, or come back again uh, to Burlington. And I'm not sure if maybe it wasn't, they didn't get the, um, that they didn't get the, the uh, crowds that they were looking for, or I, I'm not really quite sure what the rationale is that it hasn't come back, um, but it certainly hasn't uh, made its way back to our area, or at least close to us. The closest one of uh, the Mother Earth News Fairs that I've seen in the last several years has been the one in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, which is just outside Pittsburgh, but that's still a seven or eight hour drive one way for me and I believe this coming year they're actually moving that one to Polyface Farm so again we're talking an eight or nine hour drive for me to make it to that I also uh, I'm aware of the Homesteaders of America conference which happens in Front Royal Virginia and uh, that's one that I would absolutely love to go to but again we're talking an eight or nine hour drive to get there then I know Baker Creek has several festivals around uh, the United States and California and Missouri. Again, a huge distance for me to drive or to fly. And Doug and Stacy from Off Grid with Doug and Stacy were advertising a conference coming up, I believe, next year that's out in the Midwest. So my question to you is which ones have you been to? Which ones have you found most beneficial and which ones would you recommend that I check out? Because for me, I work a full-time off-farm job. So this is going to be a bit of a vacation for me. I'm going to have to take time off work to make it to any one of these. That's going to require an investment of time. Obviously, we've got to get somebody to come in and take care of the animals. 
So I don't have the luxury of going to every one of them. I've got to choose one or maybe two uh, to go to. And so I would love to hear from you as far as what your perspective is. If you've been to any one of them, if you've been to multiple ones, I'd really love to know that and to know which ones you've found most beneficial. So if you could, if you're watching this on YouTube, obviously you can reply in the comments below and uh, leave me some feedback. I'd love to hear from you. Or you can send an email to the Homestead Podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you and uh, to get your feedback on which conference you found most beneficial and that you would recommend that I attend. On this episode's Charting the Course segment, I want to answer or at least attempt to answer the question, what does it mean to homestead? What constitutes homesteading? I think this is a question that anybody who does any kind of homesteading related content, who provides that, whether a blogger, podcaster, YouTuber, whatever, they've all wrestled with this question, whether directly or indirectly. And I think many people in homesteading wrestle with this question. I see it pop up periodically in some of the homesteading groups I'm a part of. Unfortunately, generally, it's in a negative connotation where you'll have somebody say, well, you're not a real homesteader because you don't do X, Y, and Z, or you're not a real homesteader if you don't, you know, whatever. Um, and so, again, the question is, what does it mean to homestead? What is a homesteader? So why is it that people wrestle with this term? And why is it that sometimes there is a bit of a heated argument in some of the homesteading communities? Well, I think homesteading is one of those words that to a certain extent is morphed in meaning over time. And there really is no longer a standard definition of homesteading. Now, obviously you could look up a definition of homesteading but even that, even Google isn't very helpful when it comes to defining the term. I mean, Google's definition is a house, especially a farmhouse and outbuildings, or number two, as provided by the Federal Homestead Act of 1862, an area of public land in the West, usually 160 acres, granted to any U.S. citizen willing to settle on and farm the land for at least five years. Well, Definition number two obviously no longer applies simply because the Homestead Act is a thing of the past. I believe it ended in the 1970s, although periodically you do see people jump onto uh, some of the Facebook groups and, and homesteading sites wanting to know where they can get some of that free land. Well, if you know where to get some of that free land, please let me know. But as far as I know, uh, that ended, that program ended ended in the 1970s. So the first part of the definition really isn't all that helpful either. And so that really leaves us to kind of come up with a definition or an understanding uh, outside of the typical dictionary definition. Since this podcast is entitled The Homestead Journey Podcast, I think it is important that you understand my perspective of homesteading so that when I'm using that term, you understand my frame of reference and we're kind of on the same page. So as I said, I think homesteading is one of those words that's kind of morphed in meaning over time. But generally speaking, I think we have a tendency to define homesteading from the standpoint of where someone lives and what someone does. Many times our image or our thought of what constitutes a homesteader is someone who lives in the country and generally on a sizable piece of property, 5, 10, 15, 20 acres of land. And on that property, they're doing a whole bunch of what's. They're doing a whole bunch of things. And that's what makes them a homesteader. So they may be, for example, raising animals for meat and other products, cows for meat and milk, uh, goats for meat and milk, maybe some sheep for wool and meat. Uh, they're raising rabbits, they're raising chickens for meat and eggs, they're raising pigs, they're raising uh, guinea hens, they're raising turkeys, they're raising quail, uh, and the list goes on and on. But they're raising animals of some sort. They also have a large garden. 
And from that garden, they're harvesting the produce, they're preserving it through freezing, canning, dehydrating, fermenting. They probably have a root cellar as well. Um, if they're very lucky, they have a stand of maple trees. They're tapping the trees and they're making maple syrup. They have a woodlot, and from that woodlot, they're harvesting wood to heat their homes in the winter. And if they're really hardcore, they're using that wood to cook their food. They have bees, and they're harvesting honey from the hives. Maybe they have the ability to uh, forge knives and tools. Um, if they're really hardcore, they're off-grid. Of course, they're conservative Christian people with an extremely large family, at least 10 kids. They homeschool all of their kids. They hand make their clothes. They hand pump their well water. And if they're really hardcore, they have a compost toilet or an outhouse. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what comes to your mind when you think of a homesteader or what comes or what used to come to your mind as far as what constitutes a homesteader. But my guess is that for you and for many people, at least before you knew any better, <laughs> uh, what makes a homesteader is where someone lives and what someone does. Now, certainly all of what I described can constitute homesteading. But I think it's a very narrow view of what homesteading can be, or really, in reality, what homesteading really is. What if homesteading is less about where you live and what you do, and it's more about how you live your life and why? Now, that's not to say that where you live won't impact your ability, for example, to raise and grow food. And that's not to say that what you do isn't important, but I believe that at its core, what defines homesteading, what makes someone a homesteader has more to do with how they live their lives and why they choose to live their lives in that manner. You see, first and foremost, I believe that homesteading is a lifestyle. If you are serious, for example, about raising and growing food, it is going to impact virtually every aspect of your life. It's going to impact how you spend your time. It's going to impact how you spend your money. It's going to impact the food you eat. It is going to impact virtually every area of your life. You see, homesteading is not something that you just do on the weekends. It's not something that you just do during the summer months. It's not something that you just do when you feel like it. If you are going to be successful, it has to become a part of your lifestyle, especially if you have animals involved. You see, animals don't care whether or not uh, you feel like it or not. They still expect to be fed, watered, and cared for. They don't care whether or not you've got a case of the sniffles. They still expect to be fed and watered and cared for. Uh, if you've got a girl's weekend away or a guy's weekend away, you've got to find somebody to take care of your animals. Uh, if your tomato harvest is coming on, it's not going to wait for you. You're, you need to handle the tomato harvest when it comes on. When the cabbages are ready, you've got to harvest, harvest them or they are going to split, the deer are going to get them, and then you've got a lot of wasted effort. The point being, folks, is that if you're going to be serious about raising and growing food, if you're going to be serious about homesteading, it has to become a part of of your lifestyle. And if you go back to episode one and you hear my story about how I was raised and the fact that I didn't associate the word homesteading with how I was raised, and yet I consider myself a fourth generation homesteader at least, the reason is that for us, this was just living. We weren't taking cutesy little photographs and posting them on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or Pinterest or anything like that. It wasn't about that. For us, we lived our lives in concert with the seasons. In the spring, we got our chicks and we got our seeds. And in the early summer, we planted our gardens and we tended to them. And then we started harvesting the produce and preserving the the harvest. And and in the fall, we butchered off animals so that throughout the winter, we would be able to eat. We would be able to survive. For us, it was a lifestyle. We didn't have a name for it. We didn't know that what we were doing was considered homesteading. But that's what I grew up doing. That's what my dad grew up and my mom grew up doing. That's what my wife's parents grew up doing. We grew up living this because it's a lifestyle. At its core, homesteading is a lifestyle. 
But not only is it a lifestyle, I also see homesteading as a journey. And it's really a journey towards three goals, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And while it's a journey towards those goals, I don't believe that we will ever, ever get there. I don't believe anybody will ever be fully self-sufficient, fully self-reliant, or fully sustainable. And that's okay. I don't say that to discourage anybody. Rather, I say that to encourage us. Because when we fall short of those ideals, when we fall short of those goals, sometimes it's very easy to beat ourselves up, to throw our hands up, and to quit. But folks, this is a journey. Homesteading is a journey. It's not a destination. A lot of times we have a tendency to think of homesteading from the standpoint of a destination, whether it's the location in the country, the 5, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres of land, or this accumulation of all of these skills. Now I know how to do all of these things, so that is, that's what makes me a homesteader. But that's not what it's about at all. We're on a journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Now what do I mean by those terms? To me, self-sufficiency speaks to stuff. Can I raise, grow, produce, and process the stuff that I need? In my mind, self-reliance speaks to skills. Do I have the skills necessary to raise, grow, produce, and process the stuff that I need? And sustainability speaks to systems. Now, a lot of times we think of sustainability from the standpoint of environmental impact, and I certainly do think that as homesteaders, we are concerned about our impact on the environment. But when I use the term sustainability, I'm speaking to systems that can maintain themselves with minimal to no off-farm inputs. So what do I mean by all that? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Let's say my family and I decide that we want to be self-sufficient with regards to chicken. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we would no longer want to go to the store to buy chicken. We would no longer want to go to the farmer's market to buy chicken. We would no longer want to contract with a farmer to raise chickens for us. Rather, we want to raise all of the chicken that we are going to need for a given period of time. So we would sit down and we would say, okay, how many chickens on average do we eat, let's say per week? We say, okay, on average we eat one chicken a week just for simplicity's sake. So that means that we need to raise 52 chickens a year in order to be self-sufficient with regards to chicken. So then what does it mean to be self-reliant? Well, to be self-reliant would be, do I know how not only to raise the chickens, but do I know how to process the chickens to put them in the freezer so that I don't have to take the chickens anywhere to have anybody else do anything for me or for my family. Rather, together, we can raise, grow, produce, and process the stuff, the chicken, that we need. Now, how does sustainability play into that? Well, a sustainable chicken operation would be one where we would have a rooster and hens. The rooster fertilizes the eggs. The hens sit on the eggs. Eventually, the chicks hatch. Now, no longer do I need to go to the feed store. I don't need to go to Tractor Supply. I don't need to order chicks through the mail. Rather, my homestead in the sustainable system is producing all of the chicks that we're going to raise to then put into the freezer. But not only that, we are also keeping these chickens on pasture and we're raising maybe some oats and some barley and some sunflowers that we then harvest and process into some kind of a, a, a grain ration that we then feed our chickens. So therefore, we don't need to go to the feed store and buy feed. We no, need, no longer need to go to the local feed mill and buy feed. Rather, we have a sustainable chicken operation, a system in place within which we can apply our skills to raise, grow, produce, and process the stuff that we need. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is an optimal manner by which you should raise chickens. Don't get me wrong. I certainly don't. Certainly not the most cost-effective, definitely not the most efficient way to raise chickens. But I give you that as just a simple illustration of what I mean by sustainability, self-reliance, and self-sufficiency, and how they kind of all tie together. Now, your goal may be self-sufficiency with regards to chickens, but you have no desire whatsoever to process chickens. You don't wanna, you, you're, you're happy taking them, you've got a, somebody that'll process the chickens for you, great. Self-sufficiency with regards to the chickens, chicken meat is an admirable goal. 
Maybe you don't care about that at all. Maybe you're happy going to the store and buying chicken. That's great too. See, that's why I think it's so important to look at homesteading from the standpoint of a journey. Because the things that are important to you may not be important to me. And the things that are important to me may not be important to you. And it's all good. There's, a, there's room enough for all of us under this umbrella called homesteading. And we don't need to worry about what anybody else is doing as to whether or not they're a real homesteader or not. I mean, come on. It just drives me nuts when people get kind of lost in that. You're not a real homesteader if you don't have a family milk cow. I don't want a family milk cow. I don't have room for a family milk cow. Now, if you want a family milk cow, great on you. Someday I wouldn't mind having a cow, but it's not a real pressing need for me. Now, you may have a need for a family milk cow. Maybe you've got some kind of a milk allergy. You need A2, A2 milk, whatever, and so you have a need for it. Then, then your journey is going to be in that direction, and that's okay. That's why, to me, it's so important to understand homesteading within the context of a journey. You see, another thing I think that happens sometimes and I, I've seen this happen in other hobbies and interests outside of homesteading. It's not just in homesteading. But what happens is people are kind of new to a topic, new to uh, an area. And so they're looking for someone to follow. And so they jump in and they just try to imitate everything that so-and-so is doing. And I understand why people do that, especially in the area of homesteading when people maybe haven't grown up with any kind of a framework whatsoever with regards to raising chickens or uh, planting a garden or anything like that. But keep in mind, folks, that Joel Salatin's journey is not your journey. Elliot Coleman's journey is not your journey. My journey is not your journey. Justin Rhodes' journey is not your journey. Al Lumna from Lumna Acres, his journey is not your journey. And, and folks, the list could go on and on and on. You need to walk your path. You need to live your journey. And you need to stop worrying about what other people think about whether or not you're a quote unquote real homesteader. It doesn't matter. You're on your journey and that's what matters. There's no doubt that some of us are farther down the road than others. Some of us were lucky enough or blessed enough to have been born into this lifestyle. Other people are relatively new to it. It's okay. Even those who are relatively new to it, they may have experiences, they may have knowledge that they've acquired that is greater, deeper, broader than some of the knowledge that those of us like myself who have been living this in essence their entire lives even have and we can learn from each other you've got your journey I've got my journey we're on this journey towards self-sufficiency self-reliance and sustainability together and it's all good whatever your goals are for your homestead work towards those goals and stop worrying about what other people think because what other people think it doesn't change the fact that you are a homesteader. If you are journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, then in my opinion, and again, we, we don't know each other all that well. You're just getting to know me and I'm just getting to know you. So take it for what it's worth. But in my humble opinion, Brian Wells from 3B Farm and Homestead in beautiful upstate New York, if you are journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, you're a homesteader in my book. And I'm proud to call you a partner on this journey towards those goals. All right, folks, that's the end of today's Charting the Course. Let me leave you with an awesome homestead hack. Now, on our last episode, I talked to you about Google Keep Notes, a great way to keep track of your tasks on your homestead. This hack involves another one of Google's applications. And no, I'm not sponsored in any way, shape, or form by Google. So let me just get that out of the way. Now, I certainly wouldn't mind that. So Google, if you're listening, hit me up. You know how to get in touch with me. And let's work out a deal. 
<laughs> no. But on a serious note, I use Google Sheets as my record keeping software for our homestead. It's very simplistic, but I'm a simple kind of guy. Uh, but I really, really love the fact that I can have access to my Google Sheets on my phone using the app and then access them through a web browser. And I use it to keep track of my mileage. I use it to keep track of uh, my expenditures. I use it to keep track of my income. Um, and then at the end of the year, I can print all of that out. I can take it down to my accountant with my receipts and boom, I'm done. Now, you may not use any of that for tax purposes, and that's fine. But I do think that it's important for you to keep track of how much money you're spending on your homestead, to keep track of how much your vegetables that you're growing that you thought were going to save you money, how much that actually cost you. How much does it cost you to keep your chickens through the winter when they're not laying eggs? How much does it cost you uh, to raise a pig? How much, all of those kinds of things, I think it's very good. I think it just shows a sense of good stewardship to keep track of all of that. Now, obviously, if you are running some kind of a more complicated farm business, uh, this may be too simplistic for you, and you may need a more complicated or more comprehensive accounting uh, software. And there are a few out there that I've played around with that I could recommend, uh, but in my particular situation, a guy that's selling some eggs and some vegetables and, you know, some pigs here and there, this works for me. And it's something that I think that is simple enough that it can work for a lot of people on their homestead. So Google Sheets is my homestead hack of this episode. Before I wrap up this episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast, let me ask you a quick favor. If you enjoy what you are hearing, let me know. Send me an email at thehomesteadpodcast at gmail.com or if you're watching this on YouTube, leave me a note in the comments below. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you don't like. I want to get better at this and I want to provide you with content that you will enjoy and that you'll find helpful. But if also you're enjoying this, do me a favor. Pop on over to iTunes and leave a review and share this with friends and neighbors and maybe even enemies, but people that you think might enjoy this podcast. I really, really would appreciate it. My goal is to help as many people as I can on the homestead journey, the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. So until next time, everybody, thanks so much for joining us.